it was uh, it was Good Friday. We were supposed to be headed to New Orleans with our friends, with some friends for Easter, but obviously the trip had been canceled. The next day in recovery, and I have this catheter in my femoral artery that has to be removed. And they come in and they act like it's nothing. It's not a big deal. And while this is happening, my, my husband is in the room with me. My parents and my grandparents happen to be outside. And my father-in-law happens to be outside. They, they said, oh, well, just a minute. We just got to get this thing out. It'll only take a second. And they acted like it was going to be as simple as taking out some stitches or removing a, a cast or something. I mean, actually, it was really a no-brainer. There wasn't a doctor there. It was just a nurse, uh, two nurses and a, like a student nurse. Then the nurse was this big guy. It was a big blonde guy, and he had arms. His forearms were like as big as my thighs, which I knew because he had his he had them down by my thighs. Um, he was you know lifted back the blanket, and he was going to you know remove the catheter. And so I just kind of looked away for a minute, and I'm looking over across. I'm looking for my bed. I'm looking over at the two female nurses. The it's looking like an older veteran nurse and a student nurse, and their faces look shocked all of a sudden and then I hear the I hear the words it's a bleed and then I look down and I see just this geyser gushing up out of my groin area and then I hear the nurse the big nurse say to my husband hold her down and my husband then holds me down at the shoulders holds me he's over he's at my head and he's holding me down at the shoulders and He's doing this big nurse is doing a lot of this pressing down on my on my hips and my groin. I just feel things cracking and tearing underneath it underneath and I hear him say something about the bed is broken. I can't get the bed to lift up. Um, she's had too much blood thinner, some you know, along uh, you know, things along this line. I'm kind of starting to lose consciousness and it really, really is incredibly painful. And I look up at my husband, he looks down at me, and the look on his face is clearly that he thinks I'm going to die. From there, I float up, and I'm watching from the ceiling as they walk him towards the door. And I see, I can look down as though there's no roof on this place, and I can see my family out in the hallway. And, and then I can see myself laying in the bed and the, the, uh, the crash cart coming through and the, 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 the code team, the, the, the respiratory team coming there to try and resuscitate me. And I worked in a hospital for several years, so I knew about code blues and I knew about, about the special crash cart and all that stuff. I knew about it. Um, I'd seen it, you know, seen it, so I knew. And so um, I didn't hear the code blue being called. I know about the code blue because my grandmother told me later. I, I'm floating up and I'm watching that happen. I don't really see them. I see them just start to kind of gather around my body, but I don't, I don't, I don't see them do any work on it. And the next thing I know, I am, I'm off in this incredible place that's just full of light, and it's the most, it's this soft pink sort of light, and I just feel. I just feel suddenly just completely warm and safe and like I know every like every answer that I had like all these baffling questions and things that were confusing me all the time are just immediately lifted and cleared. I knew everything. I knew that I had died. Or I, you know, I knew where I knew what it was. I knew that I was dying. I knew that I was going to like basically heaven or whatever. Um, I felt different from what other people experience I guess I didn't see like necessarily the same guide angel sort of person walking me I felt like I was this really tiny tiny person on like a godlike mountain like it was like it was like I was a little Thumbelina in God's palm of his hand or something like he was he, he was all around me but too big for me to take in like too big for me like his face I mean it was just way too big for me to get like a look at his face his or her face uh, but I was definitely being carried by this godlike entity, which I think I'm comfortable with um, thinking of in, in in masculine sort of fatherly terms. I think probably because I didn't have that great of a relationship. I didn't have like a nurturing, cozy father. So maybe that's why. But um, I'm real comfortable with, with that uh, characterization, which is I, I think above anything I believe that um, that what we manifest in our in our experience of afterlife is what we imagine it to be. You know, I think that that what we feel comfortable with and what we've always thought of it as and what references to our own expectations is what will end up happening. So uh, in terms of 
God and heaven and all that. So I think that that is really what it is. It's all the same thing. It's just that we take our beliefs into it. So that that's what manifests. It was the most perfect place. And it was just wonderful. Now, I didn't have a sense of who I was. I didn't have a sense that I was leaving anyone behind. I didn't, I didn't have that at all. I did have a sense that I was going home. I had a sense that I was, that I was finally going home, that I was going to finally find the place where I belonged, that, and that there, were people, that there were people just waiting there with open arms and a place at the table that they couldn't wait. They were so excited to see me. And that was sort of what I'd been waiting for in my life that I didn't get. And so that sounds really, really cool. Um, but I, didn't, I d- definitely didn't have any sense of my sons. I didn't have any sense that I was leaving my sons behind or that I was, didn't have that at all. I, I did have, I had this sort of life review. I was being, I was walking, the whole time I was moving, I was moving. I was in, the whole time I was in movement. And the whole time there was this sweet sound it was like it was like everything was experienced in all of the senses. Like it was like there was a sweet sound, there was a sweet soft smell, and the light, and everything was just and the like the air was warm and soft. It, everything was just perfect, and it was experienced on every and er, in every sense and beyond the, these senses. See on all sides of me, I'm headed to, sort of down this this tunnel. It wasn't a narrow tunnel. It was like a it was almost like a hallway, like a corridor, and on all sides of it was my life playing scenes of my life and and the sense that I was getting was that this this God that was carrying me it was kind of carrying me like I was like a baby bird or something like close to his chest I could smell him and feel him and and it was just kind of carrying me there so I'm walking but like floating it was like a smooth smooth movement but I wasn't walking I was definitely not walking I was definitely being carried which is different than I've heard people describe Uh, so far I haven't seen anyone that I recognize in fact, I don't see anyone that I recognize, but of course, in my like my grandparents hadn't died yet or anything, so there I didn't really I wasn't that close to anybody who died yet, so that's that's sort of an interesting thing too. Maybe that's why. But so yeah, so so far I hadn't seen anyone that I that I recognized. Um, but yet at the same time, I recognized everybody. I was everything was familiar. And wonderful. Definitely didn't feel like I was in this foreign, scary place whatsoever. I felt like I totally belonged there, more than I belonged anywhere in my whole life. Everything was perfect. Every kind of insecurity or any, there was just no, none of that was, was, was existed anymore. Then, this is when I was asked about going back. Because it was going to be so tough for me when I went back, he wanted my, me to have a commitment. He wanted me to understand that it was going to be tough when I went back. And that I had a choice. And I said, no way, I do not want to go back. I don't want to go back. don't want to go back right now. I just, it's too wonderful here. And then I saw my sons. Then he showed me my sons. And they were totally different. Their hearts were broken. They had their circumstances, their family, their life could not sustain the, the loss of their mother. They had no one. No one that was going to come in to fill in for me. No one was going to love them unconditionally. And the outside world would not know that they were orphans because they would have family all around them. They wouldn't know how alone they were. And so I immediately said, I've got to get back. I've got to get back. I knew my mission. I knew one of my most important purposes in life was to stop this cycle of abuse in my family and to love my kids unconditionally and to be a teacher of unconditional love and empathy and compassion. And so I went back, and I went back with the understanding that I wasn't going to remember everything right away and that I had the fight of a lifetime ahead of me, but that I had everything that I needed already. I had everything that I needed to, to win the battle I had within me already. Of course, I am a master of repressed memories, so I go back and I don't remember anything. All I remember is that it happened a... And that, that I had chosen to come back because my sons needed me. That's really about all that I, that I remembered of the whole thing at first. At first. It would, it would eventually come back to me, as would m- most of my childhood memories. I would eventually get all of the memory back. I mean, you know, just about all of it. I think I, think I would get everything back as far as, as so I, to where I was at, about like anybody else. I remembered my childhood as well as anybody else. Eventually, I have a few years left where I'm going to just keep pushing things down. And then 
in a few years, an epiphany is going to come, and I will stop pushing things down, and wave after wave of realization will come to me, and and I will be transformed. It will be really, really tough, but life will be transformed, and I'll be new. But I regain consciousness, and the nurses are just sweating, and they're like, I mean, it's clear that everyone has been through a hugely traumatic event. That, it, that much is very, very clear to me. The male nurse says, well, you gave us quite a scare there, you know. Let's get you out. Let's, oh, the, the, the female nurse, she, I heard her say, let's get you out of these. Let's get you out of these things. And there's some clean clothes. And so they, like, whipping me around. They're moving, you know, really quickly, picking up all these blood-soaked linens, changing my clothes, propping me, cleaning me all off, pr- propping me up in bed, wiping me down, getting me to look decent clean. And within just a few seconds, they're like, all the evidence of whatever this trauma was, was gone. And they said that my family, my, your family's been waiting out in the hallway this entire time. We need to, you know, we really ought to go get them. But I had no idea what they meant. I mean, like, like she said this entire time as though, as though I'd been there this entire time, which I certainly hadn't been. I had no idea what had been going on, except for that I was in so much pain that I had a feeling that I got the sense that resuscitating me had been a brutal, brutal process. You know, when I come to, it, it surprises me that my husband's not there because I don't really remember that he got moved to the door. I don't remember, you know, the part about starting to float up and seeing him get moved, that I have, I have, I have no memory of that right now at this point. The last thing that I remember was looking up at his face and saying, I think I said, why are they doing this to me? And then I lost consciousness. And so that was the last thing I remembered was seeing that look on his face that was a clear look of that he knew I was going to die. It seemed like clearly he knew I was going to die, but I couldn't tell what he felt about it. So they let in my, they go to the door and they let in my family. In walks first my grandparents, and they're beside themselves. They're, they're just, you know, hysteric. My grandfather's looks like he's got, you know, just tears streaming down his face. My grandmother's crying. She's like, oh, my God, we thought we were going to lose you. They, they called Code Blue two times, and they came rushing in here, and, and you know, we just we thought we were going to lose you. This is... You know, and she gave me, gave me this hug, and it was just like, so, so that was how I knew, I knew about the code blue and all that. I, did, I really had, would have had no idea had she not said that. My father-in-law then walked in, and he was this, you know, looked white as a ghost. He looked super scared and gave me a little kiss and then went and sat down on the windowsill. And then my parents and my husband came wandering in, talking to each other, not even looking at me. Didn't rush over to me, didn't give me a hug, didn't say, oh, my God, how you know tragic was you know nothing they were talking to each other and ignoring me and it was like we were coming with up with a plan or something I couldn't imagine what they were talking about but their heads were down they were definitely focused on you know something but they weren't talking to me and they went and and positioned themselves in a circle with arms crossed foot of the bed if they didn't come up and talk to me or anything and it was very strange, but it w- and I was still disoriented, and I wasn't ready to assess what anything meant at this point. I was just everything was so disorienting and weird. I remember trying to kind of say something about that I had this near death experience. A little mentioned something about it, and then my mother turned around and kind of said, you know, about your, about your, she said you're uh, you're you're sedated or something like that, and that was basically it. I knew a near death experience. I knew that I needed to go back and be there to offer my children the unconditional love that they deserved, that all children deserve. I needed to be an example of love and compassion in a place where, there, where it was sorely lacking. I didn't have a full understanding of it at the time, but in retrospect, afterwards, I, I did realize that I was warned that I was going to be coming back to fight the battle of a lifetime was it was necessary that that I know that the only weapons that I had were going to be love and the truth and also my faith in God. So those were the indestructible parts of me and I needed to learn that. That was the most important lesson. Not money on my side, not connections, not power, not even support, not even a loving family. I only had just the love I had for my sons, the love God had for me, and the truth, the power of the truth.